When we're talking about how things might have been or how they must be, we're using quantified modal logic. One of the key principles there is the Barkin sentence. But what does it mean? And is it true? Let's find out. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Attic. We've been talking about modal logic, about possibility and necessity. One of the key principles in quantified modal logic is the Barkin sentence and the converse Barkin sentence. So I wanted to do a pretty short video specifically on those because when I teach this stuff, it's one of the questions people ask me about the most, okay? How do these two sentences relate to all the other stuff that we've been talking about? Different domain conditions, different systems of modal logic, how does it all fit together? So in this video, we're gonna look specifically at the Barkin sentence and its companion, the converse Barkin sentence. We're gonna look at what they mean, when they're valid, when they're not valid, and just think a little bit about whether we should think they really are true or false. Okay, so if you're finding these videos useful, if you're studying this stuff and it's being good for you, why not hit the subscribe button? It will be great to have you on board. Okay, so what is the Barkin sentence? Well, it's a form of sentence named after Ruth Barkin, later Ruth Barkin Marcus, she is a really interesting character in the development of 20th century logic. She was writing a lot of very important papers around the mid-century. And in fact, you know, there's a lot of ideas that get associated with people like Kripke, like the idea of the necessity of identity, rigid designation for proper names. Ruth Barkin had a lot of those ideas back in the 40s before Kripke got hold of them. Now, is this a case of a white dude getting hold of a woman's ideas and kind of passing them off as his own? Like, that doesn't happen, right? Okay, so we're not going to get into that here, but there is some interesting literature on it. If you're interested in that, go and have a Google, Kripke, Barker Marcus, see what you can find. What we're going to look at here is the Barkin sentence, the converse Barkin sentence, and how they relate to models in quantified modal logic. So here is the Barkin sentence. In fact, it's a whole bunch of sentences for any sentence A. There's a Barkin sentence. It's an if then. Basically, it says there's interaction between the quantifier and the modalities. Specifically, if you've got for all followed by a box, you can switch it around so that it's a box followed by for all. The Barkin sentence tells you that that move is okay. The converse Barkin sentence goes the other way around. So it tells you if you've got a box followed by for all, then you can switch them around so you get for all followed by a box. Okay, so we've got these two principles, the Barkin sentence, the converse Barkin sentence. Okay, these are important principles in quantified modal logic because as I've described it, quantified modal logic is basically first order logic, the quantifiers, plus propositional modal logic, the modalities, the box and the diamond kind of squished together. But if we just do that, we've got no information about how the modalities, box and diamond, and the quantifiers interact. That's what the Barkin sentence and the converse Barkin sentence do. They tell us they interact by, you can switch them around in both directions. Okay, so if we've got both of those principles, we've got nice straightforward interaction between the first order part and the modal part of the logic. However, the Barkin sentence and the converse Barkin sentence are philosophically contentious. To see why, let's just rewrite the Barkin sentence in a slightly different way. In fact, we already know how to rewrite things into that form. So why don't you hit pause and see if you can have a go at coming up with a Barkin sentence like this, given that everything like this is a Barkin sentence. Come back and if you get stuck, I'll show you how to do it. Okay, so to do this, there's three equivalences we need. So the first one we need comes from propositional logic, contraposition. It tells us that if we've got a conditional, if A, then B, we can turn it into if not B, then not A. The second one comes from propositional modal logic. It says that not box A is equivalent to diamond not A. And the third one comes from first order logic. It says that not for all x a is equivalent to existent x not a. 
Putting all that together, what can we do? Well, start off with what we know is a Barkin sentence, contrapose it, do the negation thing there and there, and finally do the negation thing there and there. And what we end up with is a form of Barkin sentence that looks like this. OK, so this sentence has still got not A in it, but don't forget there's a Barkin sentence like this for any sentence A. So if we're interested in a sentence A, we could start off here with a sentence not A. We would get a double negation here. That cancels out. So for every sentence A, there's going to be a Barkin sentence that looks like this. Now let's talk about why that's philosophically controversial. It's easier to see in this form than it is in this form. So let's pick an example. I've got one kid, my daughter Lily, so she doesn't have any siblings, but she might have done, right? If I'd had more kids, then she would have had a brother or a sister. So it could have been the case that there exists a sister for Lily, OK? Lily could have had a sister. Seems pretty obviously true. But now look at what the Barkin sentence tells us we can infer. Someone is possibly Lily's sister. OK, so who is that person? Who is this someone? It's not me. It's not you. It doesn't seem to be anyone else we can put a finger on. OK, this is telling us that somebody who actually exists could have been Lily's sister. Now, you know, maybe we can come up with a metaphysics where that's true. It might be kind of weird because it would have meant that person would have had different parents. It meant they would have had me as a parent. And lots of metaphysicians think that your parents, who your parents are, that is essential to you. So you couldn't have had different parents. Nobody else could have had different parents. If that's true, this one is false. The point is even putting aside the weird metaphysics, this side seems obviously true. In the case of, you know, Lily having a possible sister, this side seems at best dodgy, at worst, just obviously false. OK, the inference shouldn't take us from something obviously true to something that looks a bit dodgy. So there seems to be reasons for rejecting the Barkin sentence. And we're going to be able to say similar things about the converse Barkin sentence with a slightly different example. But what I want to focus on here is in what cases is the Barkin sentence valid? Or what would it look like? What would a model look like which makes it false? And similarly for the converse Barkin sentence, when's it going to be valid? In which kind of models is it going to be invalidated? Which kind of models are going to make it false? Let's stick with the Barkin sentence and let's try to come up with a model that's going to make it false. OK, take a look at this model here. Super simple. We've got two possible worlds, S and T. T is possible relative to S. And that's it as far as possibility goes. In world S, there's just one thing, A. In world T, there's two things, A and B. And B has the property F. Nothing else is F. So this isn't a constant domain model. It's a variable domain model because in one world, there's one thing. And in the other world, there's two things. So let's have a look what happens in this model. Over in world T, B is F. So something is F. So over in world S, it's possible that something is F, OK, because S has this arrow over to T and something is F here. So over here, it's possible that something is F. But now look at this sentence, OK? Is it the case that something is possibly F? Well, if there's going to be something that's possibly F over in state S, it's got to be A because A is the only thing. But A isn't possibly F. There's only one other possible world and A isn't F there. So A is not possibly F, so it's not the case that there's something that's possibly F over in state S. Why is that interesting? Well, that gives us a counterexample to the Barkin sentence. Written out like this, this bit's true, but this bit's false. So we have the negation of the Barkin sentence written out with diamonds and existentials over in this world. But we can do it with the usual version of the Barkin sentence with boxes and for alls. Let's have a look at how that would go. So now we look at this sentence. Everything is necessarily not F. Well, that's true over here because A is necessarily not F. In no worlds is A F. So everything, that's just A, is necessarily not F. Yep. But is it the case that necessarily everything is not F? No. Over in this world, it's not the case that everything is not F. B is F. So here it's not the case that necessarily everything is not F. 
That's a counterexample to this sentence. OK, that's a counterexample to the Barkin sentence. So we've got not the Barkin sentence, the Barkin sentence being false here. So this kind of model gives us a counterexample to the Barkin sentence. It's called a nested domains model because the domain here, just A, is nested inside the domain over here, A and B. So when we look at nested domain models, the Barkin sentence isn't going to be valid. We can find a model like that that makes the Barkin sentence false at some world. But the converse Barkin sentence will be valid. OK, even if we don't have a constant domain model, if we have a nested domains model, the converse Barkin sentence is guaranteed to be valid. And if we want to look the other way round, well, we could just make the arrow go the other way. OK, so now this world is possible relative to this one. We've got a shrinking domains model. We have two things over here, but as we follow the arrow, we end up with just one thing. That's a shrinking domains model. And if we look at the class of all shrinking domain models, what do we find? We find that the Barkin sentence is valid. It's true in all worlds, in all of those models. But now the converse Barkin sentence isn't valid. OK, so we've gone through that super quick. I've given you some counter models. I haven't given you proofs of validity. We're going to do a bit of that when we look at variable domain models in more detail. We're going to do that in the next video. OK, guys, so there you have your super short look at the Barkin sentence and the converse Barkin sentence. We're going to say a little bit more about this kind of stuff in the next video when we're going to be talking more about variable domain semantics for quantified modal logic. So I hope you join me back for that.